Hello and welcome to episode 31 of Think Big with Michael Zellner. My guest today is Dustin Starr. As always, my podcast is all positive and no politics. Dustin is the co-owner and host of Championship Wrestling along with his wife, Maria, which airs every Saturday on CW30 uh, at noon and also airs it's live on YouTube and you can watch that from anywhere around the world. And he also hosts the Grand City Wrestling Podcast, which airs every week. Dustin, welcome to the show. Thank you. I love the name of it. Think big. Awesome. Oh, yeah. Thank I you very it. much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. My, my pleasure. Um, so tell us something interesting about yourself that most people don't know. Oh, my gosh. You hit me with their left hook right off the <laughs> jump. Um, I'm an artist. I, I won several different uh, awards in you know, grade school and high school whether it was a drawing or there was something called scratch art, there were always these competitions and contests and stuff. And I remember just like it was yesterday, even though it was like elementary school and going through, but doing art and drawing and drawing cartoons. And I got in trouble one time for drawing Beavis and Butthead in, in middle <laughs> school. And I didn't know what they were doing was inappropriate or nothing. I was just right. drawing what I saw on TV. Um, also poetry and writing seems to be something that people think I kind of have a knack for, at least back in school and everything. I had several poems that were published in the, in the school book. And cool. uh, yeah, I guess that's something. Yeah. Yeah. That's every something. now and then I'll, every now and then I'll do some, some drawing or something, but for the most part, I, I you know, so busy that you can't just sit down and draw a picture anymore. <laughs> right. You know, it, you know, at the very young age of five, you knew you wanted to be a wrestler. You started doing promos in the mirror, pretending you were talking to Lance Russell and Dave Brown. Do you remember some of the things that you supposedly talked about with them on those promos? Oh, my gosh. Lance, Dave, you're looking at the one and only delicious Dustin Starr. Do you know that you're standing here next to blah, 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 you know, just stuff like that, but looking in the mirror and, and cutting the promos. And I think really the cool thing, though, when I, you know, and I didn't know back then, but now I look at it is what's interesting. It was Lance and Dave, you know, cause WWF and WCW had their shows and naturally everybody wanted to be on the big time. And so like, as a kid, it didn't even, that didn't even cross my mind. I mean, yeah, WWF was cool. And so was WCW, but I wanted to be talking to Lance and Dave. So I practiced my promos, just talking trash to Lance and Dave. <laughs> so yeah, that's what I did. You know, such a fun, I remember growing up as a kid and going to channel five wrestling on Saturdays. And it's the one thing on Saturday morning more. I mean, I loved cartoons in the morning, but more than that, I couldn't wait till 11 o'clock, you know, till, you know, wrestling yeah. came on television. We would take a summer vacation with my grandparents out to Fort Myers and Sanibel Island and stuff uh, in Florida. And so we would be gone for three or four weeks of the summer and we would tell our parents, Hey, make sure you record Memphis wrestling. And so when we would get back from vacation, me and my sisters, like my sisters were into it too. I have three sisters and we would all watch Memphis wrestling. We would binge watch it like three or four episodes all back to back to back. And that was before Netflix had the whole binge watching and Hey, let's binge watch the season of stranger things or whatever. So, um, yeah, man, we watched every single time we would go to the Coliseum on Mondays. We would be there uh, sometimes in studio, but definitely in front of the television. And then later on, when I started training to wrestle, I was able to go and help set up rings and, kind of see how they put TV together and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, definitely some great childhood memories. And that that's all I ever wanted to do. That was kind of it was being a pro wrestler. So, you know, you, you talk about the Coliseum and I know you went to the Coliseum and you watched matches and I think your first uh, W well, WrestleMania seven in 1991 was like the first show, you know, WrestleMania and Hulk Hogan and Sergeant Slaughter were going at it. And you said, quote, I was converted, done converted. Yes. You obviously had that moment when you knew right then and there, this is definitely what you wanted to do with your life. Yeah. Watching Memphis wrestling. I, I, you know, that's right down the street from me. I knew that like I was close. I could, I could do that one day. Um, but yeah, it was WrestleMania six at the Toronto sky dome. It was okay. the ultimate challenge Hogan versus warrior Hulk Hogan was the world champion. Ultimate warrior was the intercontinental champion. It was the first time ever that they did title for title. And it was two, two good guys. I mean, you had the two most popular wrestlers in the entire world on the planet going one on one and then being face to face, nose to nose with paint and the hair and then the Hulkster, of course. And they're just oh, it was just awesome. And it really fired me up. Ninety thousand strong Toronto Sky Dome. The 
ultimate challenge. Yeah, that's my favorite match of all time. I remember watching with my dad um, pay-per-view, and he was saying, oh, Hogan's going to hulk up and beat the Warrior. Come on, you already know what's going to happen. I'm like, no, no, that's not this time. The Warriors got him. And sure enough, when he missed the leg drop, I was like, yeah, I told you. <laughs> and you weren't even 10 years old. Oh, you were like, what, eight or nine then? I mean, I guess, man. I was born in 82, so that was 90, yeah. So eight years old. If you ever yeah. get a chance to go back, you can go on YouTube and watch. There's an interview that Johnny Carson did with Hulk Hogan in 82 after he did Rocky three. And it's a really funny interview. You know, so if you ever get a chance to go in there and watch that, it's pretty funny. I'll Hogan. check it out. The The macho man doing Arsenio Hall has been circulating on Twitter here lately, and it's really good. So I have to watch that's that. one good thing about Twitter is you get to see all the good stuff, you know, the yes. good wrestling stuff from back in the day. You know, at 15 years old, uh, your mom, I think she drove you to a diner in West Memphis, Arkansas, and you met with the uh, late wrestler and wrestling coach, you know, the outlaw Don Bass. And your parents helped yeah. you with the down payment. And, you know, then for the next couple of years, you said you, you paid your own way and you trained with them. You obviously had a lot of drive and determination at a young age. Where did that come from? I think it's fear of being normal. I just, I felt like, uh, I don't want to be mean when I say this, uh, you know, I love my family and all that stuff, but I just felt like that maybe I wanted to do something different. You know, I didn't want to just go punch a clock somewhere and make money for somebody else. You know, I wanted to do something fun. I wanted to entertain. And I think that's where wrestling came in is it to me is one of the most raw forms of entertainment. You know, you have one take, you know, you can't do it over. You can't say, Oh, I messed that body slam up. Hold on guys. Let me do it one more time. Cause right. you're, you're, you're in front of a live audience. It's a lot of ad lib. It's uh, very much like sales in the sense that, that they cheer for you if they like you and they boo you if they don't. They buy from you if they like you and they right. don't if they don't. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, you did your homework, man. My fam my mom drove me out to a truck stop and we met Outlaw Don Bass and she signed the waiver, helped with the deposit. And that was kind of it. It was all up to me at that point. And uh, I was flipping burgers at Steak and Shake. And I remember that when I was going to have my first match, I'm quitting this job. And I did. I quit when I had my first match. And I remember two weeks later going back and begging for my job back because I wasn't making any money. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it was the grind, man. I think I just didn't want to have a regular everyday job. Um, and I still don't. So anything to keep from getting a real job. <laughs> I understand. You know, and you later end up training with uh, Steve Kern, uh, who, along with Stan Lane, were part of the fabulous ones. I remember watching them on wrestling all the time. I remember then coming in the ring with ZZ Top, Sharp Dressed Man, or Billy Squires. Everybody wants you playing. And yeah, you said to Steve, quote, hey, this is what I want to do for a living, and I'll do whatever you need me to do. I'll sleep, sweep the floors or whatever. So what happened that first day when you went in for training? Oh, man, it was a, it was a – like, what does Arn Anderson say? It was like a cold slap in the face. Yeah, it was a wake-up call for sure. So I remember seeing Steve Kern several times. He was one of the agents on one of my matches. And I remember after the match, he just kind of shook his head. like, And he was looking at the other guy because he didn't really – he didn't give me a whole lot in that WWE match. You're out there to make him look good. So, he, so we built a rapport there and then, you know, told him what my plan was and that I wanted to work there full time, you know do anything and he, he take a kind of a liking to me because I was from Memphis and there were some great memories that right. Steve Kern and Stan Lane had in Memphis and so be able to work with him and Dr. Tom Pritchard as my coaches having been from Memphis that's what they called me Memphis hey Memphis get over here Memphis was always in trouble he was always in the principal's office or something <laughs> getting in trouble but um yeah Steve Kern he was one of the the coaches he was really really good uh he was the owner of the developmental territory uh, which was Florida championship wrestling. And so when I showed up, of course, I'm bright eyed and bushy tailed and I'm ready to get to work. Who are we body slamming? What are we doing? And he's, he's, Come with me, you know, welcome. And, and uh, he pull, pulled me into the actual arena because there was a couple of different rooms. It was small, but a couple of different rooms with a couple rings in there and stuff. But this was the one where they taped television, kind of like at the wrestle center where we have. And uh, he, he said, you know what you told me? Said, yes, sir. You can do anything even sweep the floors. He reminded me and I said, yes, sir. Handed me a broom. And I swept up the whole floor of the arena and did not complain and just like, okay. Um, I mean, I'm used to paying my dues in the wrestling business. I've put up rings, tore down rings, 
Uh, me and my wife a couple of years ago during the snowstorm after our first TV taping, a snowstorm hit. It was February of what, last year, I guess, right? right. And uh, there was ice. I mean, it was the one that shut us down for 10 days. And here we are unloading or loading up a wrestling ring and unloading a wrestling ring out of the U-Haul. You know what I mean? Like I'm used to paying dues and, and hard work. You know, it's it's nothing to show up at the wrestle center and I could be dressed in a suit like I am now and somebody needs help in the ring. I'll get in there. I can buy another one of these. That's cool. Let's 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 work, you know. Um, but yeah, that, that was uh, here I am. WWE <laughs> sweeping the floors. So I bet you earned his respect, though. You didn't complain. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, actually, there too in the developmental system. And that's kind of the, the model, the business model where we built the Wrestle Center as is where you have your training facility, you do your television as well. And, um, you know, that's that's what it's about is keeping it up, making something new every single time that, that you're there, you see something different. Uh, but that's kind of what the business model is after or like. And, and a lot of our trainees now, they do the same thing that I did. And you don't even have to ask them to do it. They just love it and respect the business that much. So teaching. You know, you said, quote, I knew I wanted to be a professional wrestler. There was never a question. That's why I was going to do no matter what, no matter anybody told you how crazy it was. It was a difficult career choice or as I call it, a dream career choice. The support wasn't always there. Most thought I had lost my mind, especially being 140 pounds out of high school. Yeah. My oldest sister, Ashley, was always the most supportive and still to this very day is. Did people thinking and telling you that it wasn't going to happen for you push you even harder to make it happen? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember, I remember just about everything that was said, even though I've been hitting the head a whole lot since then. Uh, <laughs> And I'm, I'm older, a lot older, but uh, yeah, I still remember those things. I still, I still use those as fuel. You know, one of the things is walking, watching the Michael Jordan documentary. <clears throat> Again, not to compare myself to Michael Jordan or anything right. like that. I mean, come on. But the, the mind frame, the mindset may not be as aggressive as his, but it's definitely like one of those things where, yeah, you said that I couldn't do it and that's why I'm going to do it. Um, but not like a spite factor. It's more like a... You know, I think it goes back to where I didn't want to just be a normal dude punching a clock somewhere. You know, I felt like that was people literally laughed at me. Michael, they literally laughed at me or they would say, man, you don't look big enough to be a wrestler. And nowadays, if they say something like they don't anymore, but if somebody would say something, I'd say, well, let me take this jacket off real quick, you know, <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> I'll show you. Um, but yeah, no, man, there were people that, that doubted. There were people that thought it was funny. There were people like my grandpa, he would always say, are you getting hurt? Are they hurting you? Because I was smaller than everybody else. And then, you know, I basically grew up in a wrestling locker room, honestly. If I was 15 years old in wrestling locker rooms, especially now that I'm almost 40 looking back, you know, a 15 year old is not an adult. Right. You know, so I was. I was able to learn some things that I probably shouldn't have learned at that time. And I'm not talking like bad. There were some bad things, but there was a lot of good things of just um, you know, social cues and, and locker room etiquette and having a rapport with everybody, you know, like at FedEx Four, man, I'm, I'm friends with the ticket takers, the, the ushers, the MCs, the broadcasters, everybody. I want to be friends with everybody because we're just all a big network and a big family and it was kind of similar with the wrestling business you know and especially now at the wrestle center we all have known each other 10 15 20 years right and so i feel like sometimes that comes through on the television screen because there is a natural comfort when you know somebody that long you know you know you were part of uh memphis wrestling the home of uh, rhythm and bruise the late Corey macklin's company i know you won several championships there and then you wrestled in the WWE in 2010. What was it like to be a professional wrestler and get to be in the ring with some of the best in the business? Awesome. A lot of the stuff that, that takes place happens before the cameras even turn on. So, you know, Monday Night Raw doesn't come on until 7 p.m., but we're there at 10 a.m. And then about 11, 12 in that, that morning, that afternoon, you're in your gear and you're working out in the ring and you're showing the producers, you're showing the agents, you're showing the other wrestlers that, hey, I'm here and I belong. Um, and a lot of people get signed based off of those those tryouts and all that kind of stuff. Um, I forget what the original question was. Yeah, what was it like? To oh, wrestle being in the, yeah, you, you would you would wrestle maybe three matches back to back to back. 
And a lot of it was just to see what your endurance was like, what, what does this guy have? And then they right. give you feedback and then you have to fix it or they sign you, but it was very cool. I was able to get in the ring with a great colleague who is um, just this ginormous guy. I wrestled Matt Stryker been in there with Tyler Rex. Now these are some guys that were uh, that these matches were for them and, right. and all that kind of stuff. But eventually those workouts and everything and taking the feedback and applying the feedback, and then coming back and asking for the job or asking for the opportunity or earning the opportunity. That's kind of how you have to do it in there. I remember after one workout, I mean, everybody was ringside, Triple H, Arn Anderson, Shane McMahon. It was the who's who of, of wrestling. And I wrestled three matches in front of them, rolled out of the ring. They gave me some feedback and they said, yeah, you're, you're, you know, you're good in the ring. This, this is good. That's good. Um, and your body's pretty decent too. So keep working and then we'll circle back around. So I thought, Oh no. And so I took one thing. I said, they said that I looked okay. So I need to, I need to get in better shape. And so you kind of have to be a realist and say, all right, WWE has this caliber of talent. If you put yourself in the middle of their squared circle, do you belong? Right. And so from my viewpoint, I didn't. And so then I, I dieted when I came back about six months later for another tryout, they, they asked me if, uh, they asked me if I knew that they had a wellness policy, which is like a drug testing. Right. And I took that as a compliment because obviously I had not. And I had just, I'd actually, they asked me if I gained weight. I actually lost, you know, 20 to 30 pounds. I went back at like 185. I was 215, went back at like 185, 190, and was just much leaner and just tip top shape, I felt. And then the, ultimately that's, that's when they signed me because you go back and say, hey, you know, you had me here before. I've done this, this, and this. And then they're impressed with you because something that they told you to get better at, you did. And then from there, it's just if, if they want you or not, you know, but being in the ring with those guys, it definitely, and girls, it's, it really steps up your game because it, you sit down in the car after doing a spot and you look at your buddy and you're like, Ooh, we got to get to work. And he's like, yep. And that's what happened to us. We're like, we got to get to work. And then we started working even harder from there. But. You were Mr. Uh, Tennessee's men's physique champion and action nutrition athlete in back-to-back -back years in, in 2012 and 2013. That's pretty amazing. Why did you decide to compete in that? I think it was ego, to be honest with you, Michael. I'm just going to be honest. <laughs> I was getting out of wrestling. I was getting out of wrestling, and one of my buddies was a bodybuilder, and he had been training me and taught me everything I know. His name's Del Rios Spellbinder. He was a wrestler here in, in Memphis Wrestling, and he said, you should try this division. It's called men's physique. So, oh, I don't know about that because I know you're strapped to the to the meals. I mean, you are. He said, man, you don't have to get that big. You just have to have kind of a model surfer look or something. That's kind of what they were going for. Obviously, they've gotten much bigger now. But uh, I competed in Jackson, Tennessee at the Hub City uh, Fitness Expo and won overall men's physique. And so, of course, Dell was saying, hey, and go for Tennessee State. It's coming up. You're already in shape. I was like, all right. And so then we trained for that. And now surprisingly literally if you would have told me, i grew up arnold schwarzenegger sylvester stallone ultimate warrior that we talked about you know buff bagwell scott steiners all the guys that were muscled up and that's right. what i wanted that's you know i loved it and so um being able to do that i never thought in a million years that i would even come close to winning a contest much less the tennessee state and then we did it twice so we did 2012 and 2013 and won it back to back and, and I, I kind of halfway jokingly say ego, there was a lot of ego involved, but also I kind of wanted there to be something, you know, because I did end up getting back in the ring, but I wanted there to be something that was legit. A lot of wrestlers come out and they have these claims and it's part of their gimmick. And, and just for people to go, oh, he's lying. Yeah, you didn't do that. You're not whatever. And so I wanted to have something that was real to where when people saw me out there with Maria kissing her and flexing and being a total jerk, right, right. that they would say, he's not a two-ton Mr. Tennessee. And then when they Google, they'd be like, oh, wait, he is. I just thought that there was a little bit of uh, a realism to that character. And um, that's, that's kind of the story there. But being in that type of shape, I felt like I got to get back in the ring. And then, of course, I fell in love with it again and just – here we are. I never thought I'd be sitting here as like a wrestling promoter either, but I guess life comes at you. <laughs> Absolutely. Full circle there. You know, um, Sheila Jefferson, who was a property manager at Mikowski Ringel Greenberg was a client of yours yeah. back in 2013. She said of you quote, Dustin has the unique way of making you feel that you're the only client he has and satisfying your needs is his only goal. He went 
above and beyond to meet our needs. Your time and efforts are appreciated. You know, you're obviously, you know, a really genuine guy. You have great people skills. Where did you develop, develop that strong work ethic from? Uh, no idea. I don't know. It's, uh, I think it just goes back to that, what we were talking about earlier, you know, like, um, you know, if you don't have a nine to five, I mean, how do you make money? You've got to right. grind. If you don't have something on the calendar, then you're unemployed. That's the bottom line. Um, but that's funny. Miss Sheila, I love Miss Sheila. Um, I think that I've met some wrestlers that didn't meet the expectation that I thought, you know, you love them on screen, but then you kind of think, mm, they're not right. so cool out of the, out of the ring. And unfortunately there's quite a few of those, but also with that being said, this is a positive podcast. So there's a lot of them that will blow you away that you think are just total jerks. And those are the nicest guys in the world. So I, I guess I just feel like that if somebody's going to cheer for me or, you know, follow my pages or tune in to watch what we're doing and, and stuff. I mean, I, I, that will never get old, you know, Maria Brady and, you know, the kids here, they, they kind of laugh a little bit because if somebody comes over and talks to us, I still think that that's cool. I, that will never get old. Me walking into a store and somebody saying, Dustin Star, what are you doing here? And me having no idea who they are. It's just really cool. And so I think I take that into account too. Just, I don't know. I love, I love it. Yeah. You never know when you're going to, I mean, just being nice and genuine to somebody that comes up and approaches you, what someone's going through. I mean, just making that person's day. I mean, just yeah. being nice and talking to them for just a minute. Um, I'll tell people that too. You know, if, uh, gosh, I received an email this morning that was just fantastic. And it was like, Hey, thanks. You just made my day. You know, there's so much crazy stuff going on out there that, you know, I know sometimes that's weird, but I do feel like sometimes, yeah, thank you for that. You made my day. So hopefully, you know, some of the stuff that we do makes somebody's day. And I just, I love that. And then also I've got some nieces and nephews that just really love it. They love going to the wrestle center and, you know, at first they don't know who any of the wrestlers are. Right. It's just like WWE. They haven't watched. They don't know who they are. So they don't. And then once they start learning and you see that they're having so much fun that it, you know, it just hits you, you know, you know, over the years since uh local wrestling, you know, and left Memphis airwaves, you, you talk about uh, how the Grizzlies, the red birds and Memphis 901 FC have helped keep wrestling alive in the area. How did they do that? Having wrestling nights. So the red birds and the Grizzlies have had um, some wrestling nights and um, even if they're not branded, you know, Memphis wrestling or, you know, Dustin Star or whatever, I mean, that's still, you know, we miss two generations of wrestling fans. So, you know, you have the uh, Lawlers, Dundees, Lance, Dave, Jimmy Valiant, all the legends and everything. Um, and then it kind of went away for 15 years. It didn't kind of, it went away for 15 years. There was no Memphis wrestling, no Memphis wrestling television or anything. So there were two generations that were missed. Right. Like my 14 year old son has no idea who these guys are other than they're my friends that we throw right. paper at and goof with in the locker room, you know? So, um, yeah, it's, it, we, we missed two generations. Now we're back and we're just trying to get everybody to learn about what we're doing. You know, for somebody that grew up, you know, watching wrestling on TV on Saturday mornings, going to the Coliseum, being involved in the sport, and then it'd be gone for 15 years. Like you just talked about. How did that affect you? It made me get into other things. Now, some of the other wrestlers, they wrestled around other territories and other areas and just kept grinding and hoping that something, you know, because every every uh, every couple of years, somebody's going to launch a TV show. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. If we had a dollar for every time somebody was going to launch a TV show, we'd have a lot of money. Right. And it just never happened. You know, so I think uh, the difference with me is I had blinders on for a long time. You were not going to get me to do anything but wrestling broadcast i don't want to do that i want to wrestle radio i don't want to do that i want to wrestle and so when i left wwe and other opportunities started to open up like emceeing sporting events and sports entertainment and all that kind of stuff i literally started looking at it for the first time ever and had no idea what i was doing actually a, a quick little story of how i even got into emceeing games is that i was emceeing uh no 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 i tried out at the forum so there were several years this is good for somebody who's trying out for something that's not getting it. You try out and you don't get it. And then they invite you back to try out again. So I got invited to try out several times before I actually got 
the MC job at the Grizzlies. But the way that it all even happened is that I was doing one of the auditions and somebody from the other room overheard my audition. And they knew that I worked for the newspaper at the time. And so they literally called the commercial appeal newspaper and asked for the wrestling guy. And so they literally transferred this dude all over the place to finally they got to me. It was like, oh, that's the guy. Okay, okay. And he didn't even ask me to come in and try out. He just gave me the gig right there on the phone. So I was going to MC hockey and I had never done it before. And so I told him, I think I need to watch somebody do it. And I'm like, ah, just, just do it. Like, okay. And I'm actually glad that I didn't watch anybody else do it because what I do is how I do it. Right. And um, it might have been a little bit different. And I think some of them, you know, I had sleeveless there for a while and uh, it was just crazy. So it took a minute to get like the wardrobe right because it wasn't wrestling, you know. <laughs> now that I think back, it's hilarious. I had like a sleeveless thing or whatever. But anyway, they found me because they heard me auditioning for the Grizzlies. And then I did that and got experience, went off to WWE, came back, uh, did another audition for the Grizzlies with Tam. It's when they were kind of launching Grind City Media. And then from there, uh, I'll, I probably will never, ever forget in my entire life. After the audition, they called me and they said, hey, would you like to do the preseason game tomorrow? And I'm like, absolutely. So the preseason game, I, I fist bumped Zebo and I sang happy birthday to Mike, Mike Conley with the fans. I'm like, I'm done. If I never do this again, bucket list. I'm right. cool, man. My favorite player is Zebo, right? And I love Mike Conley. And then the next day they asked me, they called me back and asked me if I'd like to do, uh, do the season. I'm like, absolutely. And so uh, that's that's how all that started is not getting it and just not getting mad and frustrated and all that stuff and just seeing if another opportunity comes up and then doing it. You no, know, you said, quote, I always thought there was an audience. That's because somebody was always talking about bringing mess wrestling back, just like you just mentioned. I never thought yeah. that people didn't want it. It was just a matter of presenting it and how to present it and where and that kind of stuff. And to think you started planning Memphis Championship Wrestling on a napkin in a pen with a pen tell us a little yes. bit about how that happened my uncle i have an uncle i've got several uncles but my um my uncle philip is just as smart as it can get i mean he's real estate guy business owner entrepreneur family man businessman i mean the guy is just fantastic he's awesome so a lot of times what i started doing my side of the fame is a little bit different, so I can't really go to them for that. But he's he's hit it out of the park, so uh, I can respect that and recognize that. So I was like, hey, Phil, let's go have some some lunch. I want to run something by you. I want you to tell me if I'm crazy. And so just pulled out a napkin. It's probably about this big. I've got it somewhere. I'm going to frame it. Um, but it's small, like beer napkin, really. You put your beer. Um, and I said, okay, here's what I'm thinking. And I kind of drew a circle. And I said, I need a facility with my wrestling company. And here's how I'm going to make money. Here's the revenue. Boom, boom, boom. And I put a spoke. And I put all these spokes on it and had it. And I said, am I crazy? Because you, you're you the business guy. You're not a wrestling guy. Tell me if I'm nuts. It's like, man, I, I don't think you're crazy. I think you might have something there. And so then it's like, all right, how am I going to execute it? You know, we didn't dip into life savings and do all that kind of stuff. We had built the company off of a syndicated television program that's championship wrestling from Hollywood. And then the pandemic hit when our goal all the time was to launch Memphis Wrestling. We had an event at AutoZone Park planned. It got canceled due to the pandemic. So then we just went all in after that and launched in February of 2021, um, the February 14th on Valentine's Day, because I love Memphis Wrestling so much. Um, so that's kind of how it all went down, but man, uh, yeah, it was all planned on a napkin. And then of course it, um, I, I, another little insight here is that I took the napkin to a small group of guys that were, that I thought would really be interested in it. And uh, two of them were going to be my head trainers and they are today. They're still my trainers at the facility. And the other was going to be a possible business partner. And they kind of were like, Meh. and so I said, okay. And so. I saw those guys here recently. I said, Hey, remember that napkin? He's like, yep, you're doing it. I said, exactly the way that we wrote it down on that napkin. And so he's like kind of kicking himself at that point. But yeah, we off of the napkin, which sounds so crazy, but that's where the idea came. And then I developed um, another little kind of a business model type of thing and went back to my uncle 
and and he did he doesn't have a stake in the company or anything right. like that. It's just my uncle that I was saying, hey man, tell me if I'm nuts. Cause don't let me do this just because I love wrestling, you know. Right. And he's like, No, I think you got something. And so that's kind of how the ball started rolling. And then we and then from there, you know, I'm really proud of the fact that we that we didn't have to like, you know, uh, I think the commercial people asked me, uh, did you invest your life savings into this? And they were surprised that I said no. And you know, that we've kind of taken it a little bit slow with the plan. And I don't want to say slow, but like methodical to where we know that we have to prove ourselves before we get certain things. Right. Right. There needs to be longevity for people to really believe that you are truly the new Memphis wrestling. And we're working on our second year right now. And um, I feel like that we could probably do this forever as long as the fans keep watching and, and keep chanting and cheering. You know, before you started um, at this championship wrestling, you, you just mentioned about, you know, California wrestling, you and your wife, Maria, you were calling matches that have been recorded, you know, I guess in Hollywood in the yeah. workout room of your home in front of a big green screen. Uh, was, oh, it diff- was that difficult? Yeah, that was the pandemic. So the, the TV studios were shut down. You couldn't go in. We were filming at the desk at CW 30. Couldn't do that. And so it was like, okay, we had already kind of invested in a green screen and um, a couple of lights. So we had to buy some more lights, um, just a couple of different items that we needed. But then just because you have the equipment doesn't mean you know how to work it. Right. So, you know, I don't know how many listeners or if you've ever worked on a green screen, mm-hmm. but if you don't light it up correctly, like it's terrible looking. And so the first couple that we shot just weren't that great because we were still really green to it. <laughs> And so then as it progressed, we got better and better. And so then I uh, got better during the pandemic at how to do YouTube videos, like YouTube channels and um, how to get people to watch, whether it's hashtagging or whatever the case may be. And then also one of the things is learning audio video and Adobe Premiere. So a lot of that stuff was pretty much self-taught during the pandemic, just because I was unemployed, man. Like during the pandemic, all I do is live entertainment. I was able to make that transition to where that's all I was doing. And then in one day it was taken all away right? because pandemic. And I remember there was one time that we asked like, what, are we, what am I going to do? And it was like, well, I guess you're going to wait because nobody's hiring right now. Right. <laughs> so yeah. Um, that was a crazy time, but I, I was actually able to learn a lot of stuff. And then me and my son were able to share the YouTube thing, of course, because he watches YouTube all the time. And so it's like, all right, let's make these changes and see what happens next week. It's like, okay. And then we come back, you know, keep an eye on it and then come back the next week. It's like, oh, that worked. All right. Because we remember nobody watching on YouTube. Like you post videos and it's like goes into a black hole. And nobody sees it. Right. But then with consistency, and that's why I really believe that the consistency and the longevity that we have, more opportunities are going to open up because people will really start start to believe in that, you know. You know, you lost a, a good friend of yours in the past few years, uh, Brian C- Christopher Lawler. I remember watching him wrestle on, you know, WWE, WWF, and he was so charismatic and he was so full of energy. Uh-huh. What was he like on a personal level? Same. He was a maniac. He was a madman. He was really fun. I mean, you could you could tell when he was. Hey, when the waitress comes back, how do you think she's going to pick up the check? And he would get the notebook. You know, how they put it in the notebook. And he would say, if she picks it up like this with this hand, I'm going to put a little ketchup right here. <laughs> and he would literally go through his head like, OK, she's going to walk up. She's going to grab it right there. And I bet it gets on her hand. And for some reason, that was so funny to him. Or I remember one time at Buffalo Wild Wings, he would come over and he would give him a gift card and he'd say, sir, your gift card is, it's not working. And he, you know, he had scratched a couple of numbers off of, he's like, well, maybe it's because the numbers are eh." And then he would somehow finagle a free meal. (laughs) I mean, just like, you never knew what the dude was going to do. He was just crazy. But a lot of, um, a lot of the animation and stuff probably from me comes from Brian Christopher, just being friends with him. I can tell you that the, Oh yeah it came from Brian Christopher, but not in the ring. It came from Brian Christopher, like in the car ride or in the locker room when somebody would say something, Oh yeah. You know, and just kind of do it. And then I think, I think as paying homage to him almost like maybe even before he passed away, 
it was one of those things that I kind of started working in. And when people, when I would yell, oh yeah, they would yell it back to me. So I knew I had something. I'd put it on my tights on the back and say, oh yeah. And, you know, of course I put it all over the social and stuff, but the people made that happen because when I said it, they started saying it back, but that originated from Brian Christopher. So Brian was a guy that um, just, you know, he was unpredictable in a good sense, a bad sense, every sense of the word. Right. He was very unpredictable. You said, quote, if I had a dollar every time I get asked about my hair, I get my hair cut almost weekly by my stylist, Jenny Hall in Memphis. Why is your hair such a popular subject with the fans? <laughs> I was waiting to see how long I think I want to bet here. Uh, waiting to see how long it took before the hair came up. I have no idea. <laughs> I think what happened is uh, Nick. Uh, Nick was a guy named Nick in Memphis. He was cutting my hair and he kind of came up with the style. And uh, when I left, one of the first people I saw, like, made a comment about it, like, almost like, whoa, nice hair. You know, it was, it was an underhanded compliment, right. really. Uh, but I was like, hey. And then Maria said something about it. And, you know, it didn't change that much, but it, it's definitely, like, taller than ever now. So uh, if I lose my hair, Michael, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done, man. I got nothing else. Because people are like, hey, it's the Grizz guy with the hair, you know. Yeah, I know launching, uh, you know, the wrestling uh, back in, yes, you know, I think it's a February of 2021 for you and Maria. That, that had to be just so exciting for you. I mean, just a, a dream come true to have, you know, your own company and up and going. And you said that during one of the tapings, the ceiling literally fell down in the middle of the match. What mm. happened? They hit the ceiling. This, so we were at top of the line banquet hall for the first couple of tapings. So when we made the announcement that we were doing it, we partnered with Top of the Line Event Hall and they do weddings and stuff. You know, they have very nice floors, chandeliers in there and stuff. Um, I mean, it's not like a Cairoville or whatever, but it's, right. it's, it's, it's a place that you go get married and stuff. Um, and so we started there. We put the tickets on sale and uh, uh, we sold the tickets the first day. And so we did the next show, sold the tickets that day. So it was like, wow, okay. And it was only 75 tickets because that's all that we were allowed. But just leading up to it, man, you're working so hard and fast that you don't really have time to kind of sit and think like, oh, wow, this is really happening. And then and then it's like, oh, wow, this, here we are. So I remember sitting there the first day as Maria walks in. Um, I'm sitting there the first day and I remember me and Maria are standing there and it's like we're about to count down and go on for the first time. And I remember telling myself, all right, you don't know what you're doing, but just pretend to be your favorite announcer. <laughs> 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 so that's what i was thinking and then you know um after those two tapings i knew that we needed to have our own place because we were just going to be too hard and too rough on the on the event hall i mean you you can't possibly have a wrestling show the same place that they do weddings without tearing something up and we tore the ceiling tiles down somebody hit the ceiling i think they might have broken a mirror and then the floors were scuffed up a little bit and of course we didn't do it on purpose we knew that that wasn't our forever home and then so that's how we went out and found them the so you have your own 6,000 square foot facility now near the uh, Memphis International Airport in your, in your own building. How has that changed Memphis Championship Wrestling? The Wrestle Center, it did. It, cha it changed the whole game. Um, hindsight being 2020, that would have been the first thing that I did is get, get the Wrestle Center. Um, and that was built by the wrestlers, myself, King Cobra. Um, yeah, we went in there and we had like a month to put it all together before our next TV taping. We had Jerry Jarrett on the way, the founder of Memphis Wrestling. So we had to really grind to get everything done. But it really changed the game. Now we have a place where we can train the Memphis Wrestling Stars of tomorrow. We have 20 or 22 trainees right now at the Wrestle Center. We're able to go in and, and shoot pre-tapes. and just We can do whatever we want. We can have a match whenever we want. We can have TV tapings whenever we want. So it literally changed the game. We're not at anybody's mercy. And like I said, that would have been the first thing that I, that I did. If we were going to launch now and we were talking about it, my little napkin, it would have been first and foremost. Right. Um, getting the rest of the center. Right, Maria? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, Pete Pranica, who we've talked about, you know, it's television play-by-play -play announcer for the Grizzlies, you know, joins you and Maria in calling the matches. And he said of you to do everything that you have to do, particularly in this environment where the economy is trying to come back, I think is a very, very heavy lift for him. And it just speaks to the tremendous passion he has for professional wrestling and revitalizing it here in Memphis. I'm thrilled for him 
because I know this means a great deal to him and I really want to see it succeed. What has it been for you lot guys to have Pete join you? Just can't even put it into words. I'm a big fan of Pete the person, but I'm a big fan of Pete the broadcaster, award-winning broadcaster. Um, I know a lot of guys can can fake it till they make it, you know. Right. But uh, I mean, he can call wrestling. Or the first time he was on there, standing side headlock, Irish whip, suplex. Wow. You know, it's like he's not he's not just phoning it in. And actually, how that happened is to Pete's credit, he, Pete has just been such a great guy. Um, good colleague as well and friend, but he, he reached out to me and he said, Hey, Dustin, I'd like to do some wrestling. And as I was, you know, first thing you young companies like, Hey Pete, man, budget is really tight, brother. I'd love to have you on. He's right. like, Dustin, look, I want to do wrestling. I said, I'll see you on Sunday. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, but no, I mean, Pete, Pete's super cool. Pete just so relaxed and laid back. He wanted to come and call the action with us. And he was extremely helpful. I mean, honest to God, Pete is so good at what he does. It's a feather in our cap to even have him on the program, you know, and call him the action with us. So it was very, very cool. And I'm a fan of Pete calling basketball, too. So that was cool because I was a Grizzlies fan before I worked there. So I watched every game and hearing Pete's voice. And, um, you know, I, I won't ever forget, too, the time uh, several years back, me and my son were both sick. This was before COVID and all that kind of stuff, but I never miss a game. And so we missed the game because the flu and uh, we were watching the broadcast and Pete right there shouted us out and said that he hoped that we both feel better nice. at home sick. And just, you know, something a little like that. He made a mention when Maria's mom passed away and it's not something that we ever asked him to do. He just it has his finger on the pulse of what's going on and who's around him. And I mean, that's a really cool guy. You know, you talked about the wrestling uh, school that you guys have, have out of the facility now. And I know that uh, I think King Cobra is the lead trainer. And, you know, he's most famous for pinning, you know, Jerry the King Law or the Coliseum to become the first African-American world champion in Memphis. What has it been like for you guys to have him on your team? It's been great. I don't think we could have had a better partner at all. I mean, it'd be nothing to see. I, actually, yesterday, for instance, uh, Cobra was on a – gosh, 20 or 30 foot ladder changing some, some lights in the facility. You know, I mean, he, if there's nobody there to sweep the floors, me and him are sweeping the floors together, you know? So he's a legend that uh, is an entrepreneur. He's an inventor. He has been successful inside the ring and outside the ring. And another thing that you can really say about Cobra is that he never really turned in his life to be a pro wrestler. And what I mean by that is he didn't stop working where he worked at Republic Service. He was there 50 years and he was still able to become Memphis wrestling legend King Cobra, even if it was, you know, a part-time basis. And he's cool with that. So, you know, Cobra does have a good legacy in, in wrestling, but I think he's and and building um, an even bigger legacy outside of the ring as a trainer, entrepreneur, and all that kind of stuff. So it's been great to have Cobra there. Um, Jerry Jarrett, Dave Brown, King Cobra. We'll have some more of the classic legends coming in at some point, but Cobra's definitely been a, um, uh, one of those guys you can look up to, but then we've become friends as well. You said, quote, everybody from Stone Cold Steve Austin, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, and you can throw in Hulk Hogan's name in there. Everybody that's somebody has come through Memphis at some point in their career. Memphis Wrestling was our professional sports team before the Grizzlies were here. It has a really rich history. What do you believe is the reason Memphis has been so special to the history of wrestling? everybody in the city was watching it. I mean, literally the ratings back in the day were just almost like everybody in the city was watching it and they would fill up Mid-South Coliseum, you know? I mean, it's it's very reminiscent of like a professional sports team like the Grizzlies. When they're hot, the place is packed. You yeah. know, they'll watch it on television. They'll show up and see it live. And I don't mean like a couple hundred. I mean like 10,000 would show up every Monday night at Mid-South Coliseum. So it was, it's, it's, was this, it was the professional sports team before the Grizzlies were here or before anything else. Yeah. I remember um, watching it. You know, I, I think I mentioned this to you, you know, when we were talking through messenger that I, I went to the matches, this is probably before you were born. I was a little kid, but I went to the matches of Jared, the King Lawler and Andy Kaufman. I didn't miss it. And yeah. I was in there. I was one of those people screaming and hollering and I was so into it. It was just so much fun. And then of course, you know, remember the, uh, the moment, you know, Jerry Lawler and Andy Kaufman on David Letterman 
you know, the yeah. famous slap. And then you find out later on they're great friends and all that stuff there. Mm -hmm. Just the camaraderie in the business is just pretty amazing. It is. I can't believe they pulled that off on TV. That slap. It was good. Um, it was, it was, uh, I think that's another reason that Memphis wrestling was so big is, is Andy Kaufman was just a bona fide star at that yeah. time. And, you know, the WWF kind of just turned him away. So it's like, Hey, I'll go do it in Memphis. Right. You know, it's history that we talk about all the time. And you've had some of the all-time greats already come in, you know, with championship wrestling where Jerry Lawler, Dundee, Dutch Mantel, referee Jerry Calhoun, who I remember, you know, so much. And yeah. one of my all-time favorites is Booker T. How did you get all of them involved? Well, throughout the years, I mean, we've done like sit down, kind of almost like stand-up comedy, where we're sitting down answering questions and telling stories. So that was some of the things with uh, King and um, uh, Jerry Calhoun and, Dundee and stuff so yeah they've been and but Booker T man Booker T I'm telling you bona fide star I mean he is if you think about it he should be on the Mount Rushmore of professional wrestling having won so many tag team titles so many world titles you know um he was a guy that was uh he was in jail for burglary and came back from all that to be one of the most decorated wrestlers in the history right and so right. then he came to memphis and packed out the wrestle center i mean i can't even say enough good things about him uh somebody with his star power to come to our show it's such a small venue was was fantastic he also did great on media you know chris vernon they wanted to talk to him espn radio i think everybody wanted to talk to booker t so that's how big of a deal he was he helped us out tremendously such a funny guy <laughs> i tried to get him to do the spin a roomie <laughs> <laughs> he says he only does the spinner rooney for vince <laughs> um you said quote over the last couple of years our syndicated product helped get many of our athletes and broadcasters signed with major wrestling companies we look forward to uh you know, providing these same growth opportunities in memphis um that has to be a big part of what this is about for you isn't it helping wrestlers to succeed and and take it into another level yes yes and even those that are we have some at our training facility that are 17 or 20, you know, they're just very young. So I started at a young age at 15 um, and I wasn't able to have matches, but doing the training and all that kind of stuff. I had my first match when I think I was almost 17 and nobody knew about it, but um, yeah, I, I think that I could look and see them now and see what they can be just because of how I grew up. I mean, we talked about 140 pounds out of high school and just, people laughing that I was being a wrestler and then, you know, years and years later, winning Mr. Tennessee, signing with WWE and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, just because you look at a 15 year old, 16 or 20 year old kid and say, wow, they don't look like, they don't look like they're going to be, you know, a superstar wrestler. Instead, look at it like, all right, with two or three, four or five years of development. And it took me a lot longer <laughs> son, when I was 27, but you know, if you, if you keep at it and you, fine tune and you get your body in shape. I, I just know that these folks that are with us right now are going to develop into something special. And we have several at the school right now that are going to do a great job for us on Memphis wrestling. And then eventually I think they're going to do a great job with another one of the larger companies out there. We, we do have some that are in our, in our tool belt, so to speak, that uh, you'll see at some point real soon on Memphis wrestling. Awesome. You know, you and uh, Maria, I've, I've been, I think you guys have been married about seven years now. And you've been, how long have you been married, Maria? We've been married for seven and twelve. Seven and we've been together 12. Yeah, I was about to say, about, it's about 12 years have been together. And you have, uh, right on. there's a couple of boys that you have. Is it Brady and, and Reese that you have? Brady and Reese. Oh, yeah. yeah. And y'all met at a hockey game that you were hosting. Now, now that she's in the room, I could say, who approached who? Who That's approached who? She said, you, you've done your homework. Um, this was funny. I had just got back from WWE. This was my first game back. And um, I I was working with uh, somebody named Jennifer and she had a friend there. And so uh, I noticed she was talking to a friend or whatever. She came back down. I was like, hey, who's that? She's like, oh, that's my friend Maria. I was like, is she single? She's like, yeah, said, I'll be right back. And so I went up and talked to her and Maria just fell in love with me right off the job. <laughs> not take her eyes off me. She couldn't keep her hands off me or anything. It was the greatest <laughs> thing. <ever. laughs> 
<laughs> She's just looking at me. She wanted nothing to do with me, Michael. She wouldn't even go to dinner with me, dude. That's she awesome. made me take her to Chick-fil-A for lunch. <laughs> so, old pro wrestler coming up in here trying to um, take Maria out. She wasn't having it. So I was able to take her to Chick-fil-A for lunch. And then from that point on, we've seen each other every single day since then, with the exception of a handful. Actually, I'll tell you, I remember the first time that I actually really knew that we were officially dating is that I had a tryout at uh, Impact Wrestling in Florida. And so I flew out to Orlando to wrestle for Impact. And um, I remember her calling and saying, hey, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm in the hotel and blah, 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 blah. And she's like, you didn't call me. I was like, call me for what? She's like, well, you didn't call me when you landed or anything. And I knew right then I was like, oh, boy, I'm in trouble. <laughs> that's how i knew we were dating for real good kind of trouble <laughs> yeah she's trying to ignore me now so it's all good <laughs> all right what are the most important lessons that you've learned in your life oh wow keep your mouth shut <laughs> yeah keep your mouth shut mouth closed ears open man don't don't burn a bridge either she says, I love doing that. I don't burn bridges, but I, man, yeah, I think that's the thing is to keep your mouth closed and your ears open for as long as you can. That might be, yeah, that might be the best one actually. Or whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Yep. How can people find you and follow you online? You can follow me at Dustin Starr on all forms of social media. And then also at CW30 Wrestling is our social tags uh, on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, the whole nine yards. Or you can just use hashtag Memphis Wrestling and you'll see us come up. We're on every Saturday at noon. You can watch from anywhere in the world. We have a really fun live chat that happens during the show at noon on Saturdays. So you can come in with a couple hundred people or whatever and chat and talk. There's polls and you know, you really get a good feel, but uh, it's, it's actually very cool. You watch television and you can't hear what the people are saying to the TV, but when you're watching on YouTube with the people, you can see exactly what they're saying and what they like and what they don't like. But yeah, so that's it. YouTube.com slash championship wrestling. That's the easiest way to find us. Right, man. I really appreciate your time. I know you're a really busy guy. And so I really appreciate you coming on today. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Well, thank you for having me. I've, I've listened to a couple of the podcasts. I love the one with Pete Pranica. Um, it was funny. He was talking about the wrestlers all getting a kick out of him calling the matches. And he's right. When Pete's in town and he's and he's at the desk, not that they don't like me and Maria calling the action, but when Pete's in the house, they feel like it's big time. So uh, big fan of what you're doing. And I appreciate Thank you for having me on. Awesome. Thank you again. Yes, sir. All right. You take care.